So maybe let me quickly uh, remind us where we got up to last time. So we just defined the following. So we said that P in K, and so K was our letter for uh, our essentially small tensor triangulation category, it was prime. If, uh, I mean, I tried very hard to call these things uh, K and L because I called this K last time. And I had to concentrate very hard, and then uh, it was pointed out correctly that that was also my notation for field, which doesn't bother me, but I'm just going to give up completely and start calling these things x and y. Uh, so if x tends to y is in k, then x and k. So that's certainly true, uh, that would not be a good condition. Uh, if x tends to y is in p, then x is in p, or y is in p, and then we define The spectrum of k, uh, spec k, to be, uh, and so this was supposed to be proper, remember? So prime ideals have to be proper subcategories, we're not allowed to take the whole thing. And this was all of those p, such that p is prime. And we explained how to put a topology on this, so the closed uh, so really a basis of closed subsets is given by the supports where the support of x is the set of all of those p so that x is not in p. Um, and we're going to spend a bunch of time later doing an example and you'll kind of uh, see how this works if I remember to say something about it. But remember the point was that x being supported at p is saying that x survives when you kill the stuff in p, when you, so when you localize, and so that's why it should not be in p, because the things that get killed when you invert, when you kill the things in p are precisely the things in p, right? Okay. And so the starting point for today is like, what is the point of this thing? Like, what is its reason to exist? And so, I need one more uh, definition to be able to state the theorem about this. So we'll say that a subset, uh, so this would make sense in any space, but let me just define it uh, here. So I'll say that Thomson, I mean really is a Thomson subset, I should say, but I'm lazy. Uh, so if there exists, uh, so I didn't decide whether, I'll let me define it properly and then I'll make the reduction. So if there exists uh, closed subsets, B lambda with some indexing set, such that for each lambda, if I look at the complement, which is open, this is quasi compact, and B is the union of the B lambdas. So, I mean, morally, what I want to do is I want to take uh, instead of just taking closed subsets, I want to allow arbitrary unions of closed subsets. So I want to sort of take anything that's the union of the closures of its points. But then it turns out that that's too much. That's in general the wrong thing to do. So I only want to look at things that are unions of closed subsets whose complements are quasi-compact. Um, so I don't allow arbitrary closed subsets when I do this. And I mean, this looks somehow, if you haven't seen this before, extremely perverse, but it's actually kind of natural from this point of view. So uh, this translates in this setting to V is Thomason if there exist some objects x lambda such that V is the union of their supports. 
So basically, the, the subsets I'm looking at are possibly infinite unions of supports of objects. And the reason we do this is that our category is only, only little, it's only a wee guy, it doesn't have infinite sums. And so if I take an infinite collection of objects, they generate some thick subcategory. Um, and that thick subcategory is going to have a support, which I can't remember if I defined, but I'm about to say what it is. And that doesn't have to be the support of a single object. So I sort of need to, if I want to consider thick subcategories with um, infinitely many generators, I need to allow myself to take some infinite unions of, of certain closed subsets. So is this if and, if and only if? Uh, yeah. So for that, one needs to prove something that it is if and only if. So, I guess the definition and the motivating example is I'm just going to write down what I just said. So, if, so if this is a class of objects, so for instance, it could be a thick subcategory, but it doesn't have to be, it can just be a bunch of objects. <coughs> Then I can define the support of S just to be the union over the supports of its objects. And this is always the Thomason subset. Um, and so basically the definition is supposed to capture the subsets that look like the supports of collections of objects. Should we be worried about support versus class? Oh, it's set versus class. No, I just said that because um had this habit that uh, k is always essentially small, and so this is always a set up by isomorphism. And I think I didn't write it down, but it's easy to check that if um, if two objects are isomorphic, then they have the same support. And so this is really just a, a, union, a set index union. But it's also happening inside of this spec, which is a set, and so it wouldn't matter if it was class index actually. So. And so the last bit of notation, I guess I need, and so I should be careful about where I'm writing, um, but hopefully someone will yell at me if I um, go too low. So this thick with a capital T radical tensor K is my notation for the collection of all of those uh, I, such that I is a radical, Ideal. So this is just the collection of um, thick subcategories of K, which are closed under tensoring. If they contain some power of an object, they contain that object. And then we talked last time about how this is a lattice and so on and so forth. And then Tom split K, which I guess is a bit. Uh, Dangerous, but there are not going to be any Tom spaces, so it'll be pretty safe. Uh, so this is, <laughs> this will be in stretch K, such that V is also. And so the theorem of Paul is that uh, so there are a pair of maps. Um, Connecting the, the thick ideals to the Thomson subsets, uh, it probably is not such a surprise what at least one of these is. So this is taking the support. So if I have a an ideal, I can take its support in this sense, and by definition, that's going to be a Thomson subset. There's a map back in the other direction, which I could call tau, which sends v to Set of all x such that x is supported in v, and you can check using the properties of the support that we wrote down last time that this is a 
indeed a radical thick ideal. And so the point is that these maps are inverse. So these nice subsets of the spectrum parameterize the thick tensor ideals in this, uh, depending on your criteria, explicit way. And it preserves all of the structure you should hope for. I mean, so we talked about how this is a partially ordered set. In fact, it's actually a complete lattice. This slide is also naturally ordered by inclusion and is a complete lattice. And this is an isomorphism of complete lattices. Um, so sort of all possible structure is preserved. And so from one point of view, this is what the spectrum is for. It's the space that classifies these thick radical ideals. So it's equivalent information, and that gives it a universal property and various other things, which I'm not going to um, state explicitly. I think instead I want to talk about examples because there weren't a lot of examples last time. So I have to decide what do I want to mutter about while I clean the board. Question. Yeah, I mean, so maybe let me waffle about the universal property a little bit. So one way of expressing it, and this is in uh, Paul's article with the theorem, is that you can think of the spectrum together with the support data, so this notion of support, as being like the terminal such pair. So if I have any uh, reasonable enough sp any space and any way of assigning objects of my triangulated category to close subsets of that space, satisfying axioms that look like the ones for the support, then there'll be a map from that space to the spectrum so that I get that other assignment by pulling back the support. Um, and then, I mean, the less recognizable way of saying that perhaps is in terms of stone duality. So this is coming back to the lattice theory motivation. So we saw that we could take the spectrum of a lattice, right? We can cook up some space out of it. And this lattice of thick ideals is a very nice lattice. You take its spectrum, you would get, after some squinting, which I'm going to pretend is not there, the spectrum of K. And that process is reversible, right? And that's what this bijection is saying. It's saying that sort of if I take the points of the, the radical ideals, I would get the spectrum, and then I can recover my space of ideals as what should be open subsets, but are Thomason subsets, because um, the world is unjust. So we've defined this thing, and we can ask, uh, can we compute it in some examples? And this is invariably hard, but a uh, lot of people have done this. So we can take R to be a commutative ring. And we can ask about the spectrum of the perfect complexes of, of R. And if one figures this out, it turns out that what we get is the prime ideal spectrum of R. So these are what boils down to, in this case, thick subcategories of the perfect complexes are just determined by Thomason subsets of spec R. And if R were an Ethereum, then you can replace this Thomason with just specialization clusters. So I really just take arbitrary, possibly arbitrary unions of closed subsets, and that'll determine the thick subcategories. So this is already surprising, right? Because it says that sort of no matter how complicated R is, the structure of this lattice of thick subcategories only sees the topology of R. Um, yeah. So we could also take, uh, like in Dave's talk, we could take G to be a finite group and K to be an appropriate field. And we could look at the stable category 
of finite dimensional representations of G. And so the spectrum of this turns out to be prod of the cohomology ring of G with coefficients in K. And so you learned all about this yesterday. It's a nice um, graded commutative ring. So you can take um, prod of it, that makes sense, and you get some space classifying thick tensor ideals in this, this stable module category. Okay. And so let me write down the last example and then I guess, or maybe I can do it now, so I should give some attributions. So uh, this result here, so in the case of R's the theory, um, all right, so I already regret. Uh, so this is complicated, somehow attributed to Hopkins and Amnon, uh, Neiman. And so, I mean, this appears in a, a paper of, of Amnon's, and then in the non ethereum case, this is due to Thomason. And this is due to Benson, Carlson, and Rickard, and I imagine Dave is going to talk about this more. And then the, the final example I wanted to give <laughs> connects to Agnes's talk. Oh, right, and so I'm going to write SH now. So I wrote uh, Ho SP last time, but this was just because I wanted to look up, look like a grown up in front of the topologists. I mean, normally I would just write SH. Let me move it over. Uh, so we can take the, the finite stable homotopy category, so the compacts in there. We can take its spectrum. All right, and so I, I need more room because. I can't write this down in such a limp way, I have to draw a little picture. Uh, and so the picture is going to be, it has some generic point at the bottom. And then for each prime, I'm going to have a branch. And so these branches correspond to the localization of P that happened at the start of, um, yeah, and this is totally. And then for each prime, I have a tower of stuff, which is really a copy of the natural numbers, and these correspond to the, the heights, right? These are the chromatic layers. And so this is a, a picture of the thick subcategory theorem of Devonats, Hopkins, and Smith. And so I'm not going to say anything more about the, the structure of this, but this is also a very important example. All right. And so now I wanted to sort of do an example from here, because this is going to be the least represented uh, in the other talks. Uh, we lost the oh, box. yeah, sorry. Thank you. Could, could you put some dots on those vertical lines? <laughs> <laughs> we can even make the lines uh, very precise. I mean, so what these really look like is they are uh, an infinite sequence of points and there are specialization relations. Uh, between these points. Still not happy? I mean, I've probably drawn it upside down from how you draw it, but well, that, that, that's <laughs> <laughs> I thought, what, what, isn't it supposed to be a dot of infinity as well? Oh, sure. I mean, yeah, right. So this is really, thank you, and in, in infinity, so these things, I can, no, I'm happy. Yeah, I do have a point at the top. No, no, and thank you, because uh, I was wrong and now I'm happier as well. Good. Right, so I wanted to, to do something that's closer to an actual uh, concrete example. So I want to fix R to be the polynomial ring in two variables. So spec R is, is A2 over K, and I mean, it, it doesn't really matter actually, but just because why not? Uh, let's just say that K is algebraically closed. I mean, this of course is like not really important, but um, it means that I can be slightly lazier. Right. And so we can look 
at, uh, so what does spec R look like? Let's start with that. So spec R basically has three types of points, right? So we have the zero ideal, which is a generic point sitting down at the bottom. Then above that, we have things like x, y, you know, beautiful things like this guy. So we have uh, the prime ideals that are generated by a single irreducible polynomial. And so these correspond to irreducible curves, right? And then sitting up the top, we have a copy of K2. So we have these points, X minus alpha, Y minus beta, such that alpha and beta are in K2. And so this is why I've been lazy and assumed that K is algebraically closed, right? Because otherwise I need to think harder about what the closed points are and take field extensions and actually like do something. Whereas this, I can just write this. So we have this, these three flavors of points, sort of, of dimension zero, dimension one, and dimension two somehow. So that's the dimension of their closures. And so this result up on the, the left tells me I should be able to translate uh, these primes and this information about closed subsets into statements about fixed subcategories in the spectrum. And so I want to um, to do that. And this will, of course, be exciting because, uh, for me at least, because there's some order reversal and various things that go on, and so there's a lot of opportunities to uh, stuff things up. Especially when one is um, at the board, and so. I'm excited about stuffing those things up because uh, that's probably more instructive than me getting it correct. Except for me, I mean, I will, of course, after stuffing it up, need the beer, which is only tomorrow night before I have to talk again in the morning, but that's uh, the price I pay. <laughs> All right, so. I guess I should say, so one can do this, like starting from the spectrum and the universal property and the stuff from last lecture, one can do this somehow in a systematic way. Um, and that's not what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna kind of like bumble through it Mr. Magoo style by like making the correct guess every time and then going, oh look, this is like, right, you can check. But uh, that's not how you have to do it. So it's worth saying that one can do this somehow like from first principles systematically and compute everything and get everything in the correct order. You don't have to just, you know, pull rabbits out of hats. But it's a better show if you pull the rabbits out of the hats. Right. So now we want to look at what happens here. So I can pick an idea. And so that would be, give me a closed subset di and I could call it open complement u. So this is just going to be the closed subset um, of spec r consisting of the primes, prime ideals of r that contain i. And so what should this correspond to? Well, so it's going to correspond to, I don't want to write this. So let me write it in a few different ways. So according to our bijection, it should be this tau of V of I. And so in principle, we need to compute uh, what this support actually is, but uh, what it's going to turn out to be. <coughs> is what I would write as the following, which is just notation. So let me now write what this actually means. So this is all of those 
uh, perfect complexes E. And so here I'm writing uh, D perf, but of course our polynomial ring has finite global dimensions, so this is the same as the bounded derived category of finitely generated modules. So it doesn't really make any difference. This is just a choice. So it's all of those E, so that their support is contained in B of I. And so here, there's an ambiguity, right? Because we have a notion of support, which is this abstract thing defined for any TT category, and this is just an example, and it's about prime ideals and whatnot. But then there's also uh, like a sheaf or module theoretic notion of support, right? So I could look at what I would call support R of E, and this would be all of those prime ideals in the usual spectrum, such that the localization of E at P, so I take my complex of projectives and I just invert um, things on P, I can ask, does this thing become acyclic? So it's like telling me about the support of the cohomology. And it turns out these two things are the same. Um, and so I'm not going to justify that, but sort of a recipe we would understand if we were to be the rest is that this is the same as saying the the union of the supports of the cohomology groups of E are contained in uh, B of I. And so you can translate this into a statement, right, about annihilators of, of cohomology groups. This is somehow a concrete thing. And another way of describing this category is so maybe, let's say, for an element of our ring. We set K of R, so this is the Kazul complex. To be the, the cofiber of the map from R to R given by multiplication by R. <coughs> and so this is the complex uh, that you get when I remove the, the cone and the brackets, right? I mean, this is just this thing. So it's this complex with, with two terms, uh, one living in usually degree minus one, one living in degree zero, indexing cohomologically, and the differential is given by multiplication by R. And so I can pick some choice of generators of I, and I can make the corresponding choice of object which I get by tensoring together these Kazul complexes, KR1 up to KRN. And so if you figure out what this is, so it's going to be some complex of length uh, n, the ranks are going to be given by binomial coefficients. It looks like sort of the exterior algebra. And the differentials are cooked up from combinations of these R1 up to Rn. So there's some, some matrices with entries in the set R1 up to Rn. And so another way of describing this category, I look at this, it lines up perfectly. It's like uh, accidental competence. Uh, so this is the same as the thick subcategory generated by this Kazul complex Ki. And so, I mean, I haven't, I haven't proved anything and one needs to prove all these statements, but somehow the point is that up to making a choice of generators, we have like a standard generating object for any one of these thick subcategories corresponding to a closed subset. We can just pick an ideal representing it. We pick some generators and this Kazul complex will generate everything in there under cones and suspensions and whatnot. Good. And so one can easily check that this has support in the, the sheaf theoretic sense in the right place. So certainly this is contained in here. And the theorem is that they're, they're equal. Right. So now let me write down the corresponding localization sequence. Because I have this open U, which 
which I wrote down and it's suspiciously absent so far. So I can look at my fix up category. <clears throat> right. And I can take the corresponding Bernier quotient. So I can uh, kill off all of the stuff in here. And then so let me just write that first, actually. I'm going to get ahead of myself. Is D perps of the other one? Uh, it's this thing up here, like I've just been waxing lyrical about. Uh, yeah. So this is all of the guys whose cohomology support them BI. So it's the, the thing which under the theorem, which I guess I just erased, corresponds to the closed subset BI. Alright, and so up to uh, item, potent, uh, item potent completing this thing. Uh, so if I do that, then I get perfect complexes on the open U. And so, you know, we have this duality between closed subsets and open subsets. And this reflects this duality I was talking about between like pick subcategories and the corresponding localizations, which in principle are maybe the things you care about. So I have these thick subcategories given by closed or more generally Thomason subsets and the corresponding quotients, these localizations up to item potent completing give me the, the perfect complexes on the corresponding opens. And so note in particular, right, that I can pick uh, my ideal I, say, to be something like the ideal generated by X and Y, so I could look at the origin, so then, oops, I mean this point is closed, it just looks like X, Y, and so then if I wrote out this sequence, I could write it as the thick subcategory generated by the Kazool complex, on X and Y, which is, it turns out, the same as the thick subcategory generated by the residue field at the origin. This sits inside the R, and then the quotient up to the side of the completion is the complement of the origin in A2. Um, and so notice, for instance, that when I take one of these localizations, right, I don't have to stay in the world of commutative rings. So this scheme is not affine. It's not the spectrum of some commutative ring. And so in general, these localizations are not going to give me back perfect complexes over rings. Again, they're sort of some, you know, something that you see from the corresponding scheme. Uh -huh. Right, and so for an analogy that I might want to make later, if you were so inclined, you could think of this as follows. So this really is just um, the the derived category or the compacts therein of the open complement. And what do we have here? Well, we have all of the stuff that I can build starting with the residue field at x, y, and gluing it to itself however I want. Like I can take sums and shifts and stick those things together. And so this is all of the complexes with finite length cohomology supported at the origin. And so, so I'm looking at sheaves that live just at this one point. 
and I'm allowed to have like arbitrarily high nilpotent information, so as much tangent data at that point as I want, right? Like I'm looking at all of the jets. And so what is this? Well, I can think of it as being the formal neighborhood of the closed subset. And so if you like, you can think of this localization sequence as telling me how to glue together the derived category of my space from the derived category of the open and the formal scheme on the complement. Um, so somehow this is a, an avatar on the perfect complexes of something pretty reasonable. Um, yeah, and to sidetrack myself, so part of the point that I want to make, which has only been implicit, is that we see that from this, in this language, we have a good way of talking about open subsets, or maybe like sort of more complicated things that are infinite intersections of open subsets, they're quotients. And I can talk about uh, a formal neighborhood of a closed, or maybe like infinite union of closed subsets. But what's not so easy is to pick a closed subscheme structure, right? So here, when I take this V of I, I only care about the, the prime ideals containing it. I don't pick, care about the actual I I picked. Like I could take I squared, I'd get the same thing. It would be the same subset. This category would be the same. Um, and so what you can't really do is kind of pick subscheme structures on things. And this is going to rear its ugly head when we start talking about fields, because if you want to take a ring and define its residue field, you need to localize. Fine, we know how to localize, we take the quotient. Then you need to kill an ideal and like actually kill that ideal and not look at the formal neighborhood around that point. And that's not so easy. Um, and then so the last thing I should tell you, um, so I've, I've waffled on a bunch, right, about opens and closed and whatnot, but I haven't actually told you what the points of spec of deep are look like. I haven't written down a prime for you. And so I should do that. And so here I'm going to cheat again. So it's going to be uh, in the exercise session. So it's on the sheet from Monday. We didn't get up to it. Sort of how to do this systematically using the, the classification result. And again, that's of course not what I'm going to do. So we could consider the map F. So I should fix. So I could pick a prime in spec R and I can look at the map F from R to the localization of P. <laughs> And just because it really matters, in case uh, any of you are unfamiliar with this, so what I mean by this is I take R and I formally invert all of the elements in some multiplicative subset S, where S is the complement of P. So I'm sort of localizing two stuff that the prime ideal and things contained in it know about, so I'm inverting all of the elements that are not in my prime ideal. And so this gives me some base change functor. Like so. And so it turns out that just like this is a localization, it's given by universally inverting some maps. So is this. Uh, so this is also given by universally inverting some maps. And so we can sort of observe the following. So if I take some element of R, which is not in P, then I can look at the triangle. Uh, 
uh, which defines this Kazoo complex from earlier, right? So this is just, I mean, this cone is basically this complex, right? And so what do we know about triangles? Well, we know that the cone is zero, if and only if the corresponding map we're taking the cone of is an isomorphism. And so when we apply f up a star to this triangle, well, r is going to become an isomorphism because r is invertible here. And so that means that this poor guy has to die. Um, so maybe let me write that before I erase the board. And I mean, it's not hard to see explicitly that that guy becomes acyclic, right? Because if R is an isomorphism, then the differential is an isomorphism, and that thing is compatible. generated by all of the Kazoo complexes on an element R, such that R is not in P. And maybe this condition looks familiar. This looks a lot like what we do when we define the support of an object. And what we've observed is that this is contained in the kernel of this functor f up star, whereby the kernel, I just mean all of those E, So that when I phase change, I localize E to P, I get a, an acyclic complex. And it turns out this is an equality. And so this guy is actually the prime ideal Corresponding to B. So if I want to start with my ring prime ideal, then I can take the thick subcategory generated by the Kazoo complexes on all of the elements not in that prime, and that will give me a, a prime thick subcategory, a prime ideal of the perfect complexes. And so now let me uh, illustrate explicitly for you my confusion. So the thing is, you see from this, right, that the, the bigger P is, the smaller its complement is, and so the smaller this thing is. And so therein arises the uh, inevitability of confusion. Um, so we could draw spec R. And so really, I mean, So I mean, for a lot of this, you wouldn't have been able to tell that I was doing a concrete example, but let me pretend again now. So I take my polynomial ring in two variables. And I could look at uh, a chain on this side, so I could start with a zero ideal, whose closure is everything. That lives inside the ideal generated by x, which corresponds to the the y-axis, so everywhere that x is zero. And living on the y-axis, I have the origin. So the points where, I mean, the things vanishing at x and corresponding to the things vanishing at x and y. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry. I'm just, um, it's good because uh, unchecked, I will write and say complete nonsense. So, thank you. Right. And so what are the, the analogs of these things uh, in, the, in the spectrum of the TT category, so the corresponding 
big subcategories. So here, corresponding to zero, I would take the thing generated by all of the Kazool complexes on non-zero elements of the ring. And it turns out that that will be all of those E, so there exists at least one prime so that when I localize my guy at that prime, I get zero. So this minimal prime ideal over here corresponds to the maximal thick subcategory of things that are not supported everywhere. So my primes have to be proper, right? So I better not have KXY or any free module in there, but anything else is fair game. Um, and so then this is, uh, this contains the sixth subcategory generated by those uh, K of G. such that X doesn't divide G. So I take the cones on all of the polynomials that are not in the ideal generated by X, so all of the stuff that's not divisible by X, and I get a thick subcategory that's properly contained in here, and this corresponds to the, this line given by X. And then you, know, you can fill in what goes there yourself from this recipe. It's somehow not really um, any more explicit. Somehow the the one that's very striking is that this, this minimal point corresponds to a maximal thing, and this maximal ideal, which is closed, is going to correspond to a minimal thick subcategory over here, so it's as small as possible. systematically so there's actually uh, so what's the unit object of the perfect complexes for the monoidal structure it's R and so we're comparing here the spectrum of the perfect complexes to the spectrum of R which is that endomorphism ring and so there's a, a theory of a comparison map that will always connect you from the spectrum of your TT category to the spectrum of the endomorphism ring of the unit or some graded or twisted variation thereof and so one can do all of this in sort of a very like natural conceptual way, and the same things will pop out. Um, but I mean that's the sort of thing that uh, it's it's better to read about because you can sort of easily read about it uh, as opposed to the experience of having someone rant at you for twenty minutes about uh, A two and its derived category, which is harder to come by. So now, I guess in the last little bit, unless anyone wants to ask anything, I will move on to uh, what's probably going to end up being the last topic unless I somehow start going a lot faster. So I want to talk a little bit about fields. Um, and so we've seen some examples already, right? So we learned yesterday about these Murata K theories, and they're going to be a motivating example of such things. And so I want to try and tell you, I guess, what I think a field is, um, if you can start, and then sort of motivate uh, why I think that's a good definition. Um, all right. And so, what have we seen like, in this example? So we have A space, so we're going uh, back to our abstract uh, curly K. So we have a space, spec K. And so, in analogy with this example, we can talk about uh, sort of Those subsets in the corresponding formal neighborhood. And this corresponds to things that look like thick X. 
correct an object in K. And so the, the, the thing here that's closed as opposed to, to Thomason is because I've picked this to be generated by a single object. Um, so I'm sort of closing my eyes to some extent to the story, the non finally generated things, just because it makes my life easier. And so I should really say this is not just any closed subset, this is really closed subsets with quasi compact complement. So I'm not even really allowed to talk about arbitrary closed subsets um, of my space. I'm only allowed to know about the closed subsets whose open complement is quasi compact. And then we can we can talk about the open complement. That would correspond to somehow the corresponding quotient, which I could item quote and complete, but we can pretend that that's not really a thing. I mean, so I guess I should say, I didn't say before, so all I mean by that is that when I take one of these Verdier equations, uh, there's nothing to guarantee me that even if K had split idempotence, that this quotient has split idempotence. So there could be idempotent endomorphisms in such a quotient that don't correspond to a decomposition into summons. And so I can throw those summons in. And what I get will still be triangulated, it will still have a tensor product, and so it's sort of not so harmful to, to do this and just kind of close our eyes. But of course, the failure of this to be closed under summons is interesting and is somehow like meaningful, but uh, not for us at the moment, we don't care. And then I can also talk about uh, somehow stalks. So like what happens when I localize to a prime, which I guess is what I just erased here, but it's still up there. So that corresponds to somehow a mod p p prime. And so this would be the stalk at p. Spec k. So I sort of have a, a reasonable dictionary for the stuff that I can build in terms of localization. And so the, the question is, can we sort of do a little bit better, so sort of get a bit further than just going to a point, or the, you know, the stalk at that point? So the question is, what is the analog of the, or uh, residue field at a, a prime ideal P. So sort of can I um, not localize but do some further construction to this quotient category which is going to get me to something which is more fundamental when arguments are easy to make um, than just by killing this prime. And so in some sense, uh, I guess the honest answer is we don't completely know, right? But then that's some like ontological kettle of worms, like when do you ever really know anything's correct? Um, but so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a definition of what a field could be. Uh, it's going to fit the examples we know. And then I'm going to try and explain to you why the definition is not what maybe you would think it is, should be based on your favorite example. Um, and it depends what your favorite example is. Some of you are luckier, and your favorite example would be the right thing, uh, but this unfortunately won't work for all of them. So, I'm going to make a little, I uh, guess, I'll start making my motivation sandwich. So, I want to give you some motivation, and then I want to give you a definition, and then I want to give you some more motivation. But so, the, the fluffy part of the motivation is that, I mean, what should the field be? So it should be some TT category that one somehow can't reduce further, right? So we want to sort of get something that I mean, it could have some theory of extensions and stuff like that, but we shouldn't be able to like kill elements or kill cells or take a quotient. It should somehow be as 
as simple as you can get. You can only make it more complicated. You can't make it easier. Right? And so what one has to interpret this into like something one could use, right? And so one interpretation one could make is that it could be a TT category F such that any exact monoidal functor from F to some other TT category K is faithful. And so this sort of, again, uh, looks like what you might think of if you thought of a field in commutative algebra, right? Like a map of rings out of a field is always injected. So we could ask that any exact monoidal functor can't kill any maps. Somehow it has to be faithful. So in particular, it also has to be conservative. It reflects isomorphisms. And so this is a very strong property, but I mean, why not? We could, we could try this. So basically it's saying that uh, functors out of the field shouldn't lose any information. Why can't I always do it? Um, well, it would have to be the bounded direct category at some point, and then there'd have to be a functor. I mean, maybe I have to go to any, any, any category I can count to a point, so that is isn't. Uh, not if you want it to be exact and monoidal and, I mean, already additive is going to be, I mean, it needs to be linear and preserve all the structure, right? So, I mean, it's not totally clear. Um, I mean, I, I worry that you're getting at something subtle that I've misunderstood, but there are examples, so uh, I can't be completely wrong. <laughs> I mean, maybe you haven't mind doing something like, you know, I take some category where I can talk about the lengths of the objects and I could do something like try and send things to somehow the dimension and that should be like, look like it wants to send triangles to triangles, but then there'll be things that aren't triangles that get sent to triangles. And, you know. So maybe I have like one minute left. So let me give you a definition as something to mull over and then we'll next time start with the definition again and I'll actually explain uh, the terms in it. So we did TT T category F is a field. If it satisfies uh, so small, well, essentially small. So I'm only going to talk about little fields for the moment, which is not how they're defined in the paper. But, uh, um, so the first condition is that f should not be zero. Uh, right. So we only want to look at uh, categories that have objects. The second condition is that if I take any non-zero object of my field, then I can look at the exact endo functor given by tensoring to that. And I want to ask that this is faithful. So there aren't any maps that are killed by tensoring with an object. And then the final condition which is something we will return to, and to be honest, is potentially redundant, is that mod f, by which I mean the abelian category of additive functors from the opposite of f to abelian groups. So the sort of things you look at when you look at like representable functors and things like this. So I can look at this category and I want this thing to be locally Ethereum. And so again, this is a size condition. 
but it's a more more delicate one. And so I'm I'm out of time, but I promise I'll start next time by uh, talking a bit more about what this condition uh, means, and we'll, we'll come back to it. Thank you.